lot of information to cover, so I'm going to go really fast. If you could point your phone at that QR code. Um, there is over 600 pages of research. Everything that's in this presentation, the research is in that folder, along with the presentation slides. You do not need to take notes. You can just go off the slides later. I am based out of Oklahoma. I am also Florida licensed. The uh, information that's in here is primarily Illinois, but because the Model Act has a lot of overlap, um, any of these. Okay. Oh, there we go. Golly, that's way louder. Okay, so that what I was saying is there's a lot of overlap between the Illinois statutes and the Model Act. So even though these are primarily pitfalls for the contractor public adjuster, any public adjuster should be able to use these pitfalls and make sure they're not in them already. That's the goal. Did everyone get a? Okay, make, make sure you get that. That's how you get a hold of me. That's all the files. There's a little button at the bottom that says contractor PA files. I also put some Easter eggs in there. So if we have time, I can talk, about, talk a little bit about them later, but I'm probably gonna run out of time, so. You may explain what an Easter egg is. An Easter egg is something for you to find and enjoy. For example, the attorneys in the room, since you're gonna know most of this, I happen to found a 300 plus page white, like a bunch of white paper notes that were presented to a group of defense counsel and how they tear us apart in depositions and in their files and everything that they look for and I was shocked to even have found it. So it is in that and that's an Easter egg in there for you, for example. Another example is there's um, the National Association of Home Builder study and excerpt is in there. So if you're still confused as to what those percentages are, please read that because that should stop the confusion in our industry. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. Everyone got this? I am not an attorney, I'm not a CPA, I'm not your attorney, I'm not your CPA, anything in this presentation, it's not legal advice, anything I'm telling you today, it's not legal advice. I'm, I'm just a solo public adjuster, that I can tell you my experience and based on what I've been through, take it for what it is, go talk to an attorney, run everything that you see and everything that I tell you by your attorney here. I'm also referring you to a compliance attorney. She's a specialist, that's what she does. Her name is Holly Soffer, there's her phone number, there's her email address. She is an expert in everything compliance and directly related to public adjusting and contractors. So let's just get into it. Before we can really get into the statutes and you know, how they apply, we need to be all on the same page as far as definitions. A lot of people, you kind of know what a public adjuster is. This is the Illinois specific definition. Public adjuster or public insurance adjuster means any person who, for compensation or any other thing of value on behalf of the insured, acts or aids. It's really important. Solely in relation to the first party claims arising under insurance contracts that insure for real or personal property of the insured in adjusting a claim for loss or damage covered by an insurance contract. That or aids is an expansion that you really gotta, you gotta hone in on that and that's pro Probably going to flag a few things for you later. If you advertise or solicit business, you're still under the definition. This is the second part of the definition for a public adjuster. Or represent. You can even just represent yourself to be as a public adjuster. So if your website says you negotiate or you operate on behalf of anyone, you're still under the definition. These are not exclusive. They're all of them, if you hit one of these three, you're, you're a public adjuster for the purposes of the licensing. Directly or indirectly solicits business, investigates, or adjusts. That's why I also thought this was really interesting. If you investigate a loss on behalf of an insured, you have to be licensed. I mean, that's pretty broad, so. Um, if you'll notice here, I've got the statutory references at the top. <clears throat> A lot of these slides, because I wasn't sure how big the screen would be, I did not literally put the statutes on the slides. What I did is I abbreviated them, and I will warn you about that later. That does, my job here is just to tell you kind of the pitfalls that I found. It's not to be in a completely exhaustive 
reading of the entire statute. You still got to go read it. The research is in the folder. All the statutes that are in here are in that folder. Adjusting a claim for loss or damage covered by an insurance contract means negotiating values, negotiating damages, negotiating depreciation, or applying the loss circumstances to the insurance policy provision. So if you're a contractor and you are negotiating your damages or your valuation, you're stepping over into public adjusting. This is going to be super critical for the following statutes I'm about to go over with you. A public adjuster shall not provide services until a written contract, this is, this is pitfall number one, negotiating prior to the filed and signed contract. And that's really critical. The contract has to be filed. A public adjuster's really horrible situation just came across my desk just a couple days ago. He's getting fined really large six figures. It's business ending, doesn't matter how large you are. <clears throat> and it's because they're claiming he didn't file his contract. Remember, we've all heard you're gonna get a target on your back if they find out you didn't file your contract, and what that means is it has to be the exact contract you have had an insured signed. If that contract has not been filed with the DOI here in Illinois, they will find out as soon as the consumer complains, you're gonna release that contract and then they will audit your files, go back and find you for everyone you did wrong. I heard the point earlier in the uh, conference that, you know, it's, hey, as long as you're not pissing the customers off and they're not filing complaints on you, you're good. As long as you do a really good job, you're good. No, listen, you're going to have the one customer that's not good. You did a good job, but they don't want to pay you. If they file that complaint, they'll go back, audit your records, and then you will lose all the money you made on all of those files to the maximum extent permitted by law for the Department of Insurance. Word for word, without the blanks, needs to be filed with the Department of Insurance, not literally every single time you sign the same exact version of your contract. So I would suggest that all your contracts have versions. That way you can track and you can say, well, this is version, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you're good. You know for a fact you have a paper trail that that exact contract has been approved. If, if you send it to the DOI and they don't approve it, don't use it. Don't have anyone sign it. Don't do anything with it until you get approval from the DOI. Very important. We're gonna talk about the sign part two. <clears throat> the publisher should not provide service until a contract with the insurer has been executed on a form filed with approval by the director. At the option of the insured, any such contract shall be voidable for five business days after execution. I think that's pretty normal. Pitfall number two using a contract that does not comply. There's a lot of things listed here. <clears throat> Most of them are really straightforward. But here's the thing, if you're missing one, your contract doesn't comply. So you better make sure you literally check off each of these on your form contract and that these are in there. Full name, the name has to match your license. If you're going by a pseudonym, does not comply. So if you do 10 contracts and you use your shorthand name and a customer complains, the DOI might be able to use that against you, you lose all your money for those claims. That's my point. Home state business address and phone, license number, title of, it has to actually say public adjuster contract, insurance contact info and policy number, description of the loss and its location. This is where I'm, I think, kind of an extra pitfall, description of services to be provided to the insured. What the heck does that mean? Well, it's gonna mean whatever the DOI thinks it means when they go after you. So I would say talk to the attorney in your state, compliance attorney, and ask them what they think that means. Does that mean literally I'm providing public adjusting services on behalf of the insured, or does that mean I'm writing an estimate, I'm taking pictures, I'm doing this, I'm doing X, Y, Z? You need to find that out. Signatures, but what I thought was really interesting about this is number nine. Not only does the date have to be on there, the time has to be on there. I don't know why that is, 
but that's, that's a little weird. The point is that time needs to be on there and you need to have your DocuSign settings set to where that time shows up in the blank. If it doesn't show up in the blank, you might have a violation. Good point. <clears throat> I, I do have, also have to clarify, I'm not an expert in Illinois, so I, I scanned through the statutes, read as much as I could. Listen, I only have 30 minutes, I can't go over all the pitfalls. So if it's not in the presentation, it's because I didn't have time to find it and put it in there. Like for, we had a, another presenter on this topic. Luckily, because of the way there's so many pitfalls, we didn't even overlap at all. So I was kind of relieved about that. Um, the number 10, attestation of being fully bonded. <clears throat> Does that mean you can just list your bond number on the contract? Man, I think you might have to say something to the effect of, I swear I am bonded under this bond number. So there's some things, guys, if you're modifying the contract from the state standard one, you need to make sure you've checked all this off. Uh, full compensation of the public adjuster is to receive for services. You know, why that's also important is you can't put one thing in the contract and then be like, hey, I'm gonna charge you this, I'm gonna charge you that. It can't, you can't be in there. It has to, for it to be compliant, it has to be the full compensation listed. Using a contract that doesn't comply, B1, exact percentage, expenses specified, that's pretty normal. Um, in my contract, I actually say mileage, postage, copies, all that stuff, if you're charging for any of that, or if you're allowed to, they have to be approved by the insured ahead of time. If there's any additional expenses, they have to approve them first. So if you don't get that email or that, or that written documentation from the insured that that expense is approved, it's not, your contract does not comply. So that's really important. <clears throat> the compensation provisions cannot be redacted in any copy to the director. So, Talked a little bit about financial interests. So, you know, I've, I've always heard Illinois is the exception to the rule. You can be a contractor and a public adjuster. First thing that comes to mind is where is that authorized in the statute? I actually didn't find a really specific authorization for that. But when you compare it to the Model Act, they kind of deleted some things, and it's kind of implied through the language, so um, keep that in mind. Must provide insured a written disclosure concerning any direct or indirect financial interest with any party who is involved in any aspect of the claim, including ownership of or any compensation expected from any construction or other firm on the loss. So I know in real estate, disclosure means you have to have a disclosure form and it has to be signed and in your file. It has to be a business record. If you don't have it signed, that's probably not gonna get you to over the, the threshold of actually disclosure. They're gonna say they don't remember getting it. I mean, we know insureds get policies right through the mail. I mean, I'm sure there might be carriers that don't send them, but they send them and the insured has, is like, I never got one. Well, they might have, they probably did mail it. They didn't get it. So you, you need to have it literally signed off on. PA shall abstain from referring or directing the insured to get repairs or services in connection with the loss unless disclosed to the insured, number one and number two, who you have a financial interest in and from whom you will be receiving direct or indirect compensation for the referral. You know, that indirect is in there. Golly, hone in on that. What's indirect? That's, that's really broad. I think that's going to depend on what the DOI thinks indirect is, and that's where you need to talk to the compliance attorney and make sure you don't have any kind of hidden exposure out there, expensive lunches, um, side, don't have any side track arrangements. I've talked to contractor PAs before and they have this kind of undisclosed side thing. Just, just stay out of all that. It needs to be completely disclosed, signed off on by the insured. Is that compliance attorney out of Illinois? She works in multiple states. I don't know if she's specifically licensed in Illinois, but I bet if you call her and she wasn't, she would go ahead and, and figure that, up, that part out. Or she may even work with local counsel. That attorneys are allowed to do things even if they're not licensed. They, can, they have a way to do it correctly. So. Yeah. All I know is she's reviewed multiple states and she's really good at that. And I, I don't know, I would highly suggest you check her out. Number four, failing to provide the required disclosure F1. Prior to signing a PA, prior to signing PA shall provide the insured with a separate 
signed and dated disclosure document that includes the definitions company independent public adjuster. So this needs to be a separate document. Um, the way I do it is I have literally a separate document. They sign it all at the same time. And that's, you provided it to them before they signed because they read it and then sign if you do this in DocuSign. And also in DocuSign, it keeps track of this, the date and the time, literally their IP address, all of that stuff. So that's why I really recommend people use that. Failing to provide the required disclosure continued. F2, the insured is not required to hire a PA. The PA is not a representative or employee of the insurer and the fee is the obligation of the insured and not the insurer, except. So when I was kind of thinking, you know, there's really not a specific authorization for contractor public adjusters. This implies that, that it's allowed. Like, like the DOI knows and accepts, and maybe it's just been a really long tradition that's been done here a long time. So that's business as usual, and that's why it's, it, it's worded like this. But except, and I thought this was really interesting, when rights have been assigned to the PA by the insured. So, Normally, if you have a contractor PA situation, you're a separate contractor entity, probably should not have a public adjuster entity doing contracting work or contracting work as a public adjuster entity. There's so many reasons for that that are way outside the scope of, the, of this presentation, but one is asset protection. So <clears throat> that except when rights have been assigned. So that's talking about assigning rights to the claims proceeds to the public adjuster. That's unique. It doesn't say you can, it just says accept wins. I'm assuming that's, that would be the closest thing to an authorization. You guys might be able to find specifics on that, but I don't know. Any contractor public adjusters in here that, that do this? Right, okay. Do, do, you, do you take assignments of the claim proceeds or, do, or are you signing a construction contract and a PA contract? I don't do it anymore. Okay. So contracting first, public adjuster second? Yeah, with an A. Okay, you're not gonna like me later. <laughs> all right, so here we go. We're all in number four, that's we'll keep going. Me. No, that's great, that's great, okay. So I, listen, if it's allowed and it's legal, I don't care if you do it or not. I'm just telling you what the pitfalls are, don't, don't shoot or kill the messenger, okay? This is a checklist for you to make sure you're not doing any of these things or that you're not in a pitfall that you don't even aware of. I don't want any of you to lose your business. Number five, putting profit before the interest of the insured. This is where I have a problem. How do you, as a contractor, truthfully, under oath, say that you have served your client with complete objectivity, complete loyalty for their interest above yours as a contractor too? It just, if, if there was a trap in a statute and it was spread out, all these statutes that say, yeah, basically you can, we're not saying you can't, we're not saying you can. Golly, this one right here, make sure you don't violate this. <clears throat> a public adjuster is obligated under his or license to serve with objectivity and complete loyalty of the interest of his client alone and to render to the insured such information, counsel, and service as within knowledge, understanding, and opinion in good faith of the licensee as will best serve the insured's insurance claim needs and interest. Not the contractor's insurance claim needs, not anyone else's claim needs, the insured's insurance claim needs. That also says insurance claim, not the damage to the property. So you have to represent their claim with complete loyalty and objectivity before all everything else. So if you're signing them up as a contractor first and then sign the public adjuster contract, I would, I would suggest that that is out of order We'll see, there's some more stuff about that too. <clears throat> Number six, failing to adhere to ethical requirements. Notice, I remind you, it's abbreviated. There's more stuff to the statute. I wanted this to be easy to read, and I didn't know how big the screen would be, so. PA shall not, J1, undertake any claim the PA is not competent and knowledgeable as to the insurance coverage, or which exceeds the PA's current expertise. Man, that's loaded. So if you've never worked a million dollar claim, you've only worked a $200,000 claim, you take a million dollar claim right there, that you're, you're, you're gonna have to prove how you're competent on that claim. So you better have experts involved. I don't know, you better make sure that, you're, that that would fall within that, that statutory protection that the insured has. <clears throat> Number two, knowingly make any material misrepresentations false. Okay, so that first part's pretty normal. 
The, but this part, this is tricky. Keep this in mind when you're talking to insureds, guys. I know, you're out there with the insured and you wanna sell your services. This is big. You cannot make maliciously critical statements and who's gonna interpret that? That's not gonna be you. It's gonna be allegations made by the DOI. And those allegations are gonna be supported by an insurance complaint. I don't know how you get around that. Make sure that if you're making statements to the insured that they're not critical, I would say, of anyone, any person engaged in the business of insurance. That means other PAs, other, I would go, go ahead and assume contractors because that's allowed here. I would assume that means insurance companies. I would assume that means field adjusters, staff adjusters, it doesn't matter. You need to be really careful about the statements you make. I, uh, I know this is not in the presentation, but one of the uh, Easter eggs in there is the powder dry case. And in that case, that firm got obliterated. And the reason they got obliterated is because they didn't have a PA license. But that wasn't the main thing. That wasn't the main thing, believe it or not. They would have escaped, but for, an, but for an email sent by their own employee that said, we work on behalf of you to the insured. And the first clue in business is, if you're getting these pretty long questions and emails from your insured, uh, red flag, after the first one, you probably need to consider that an issue. Like, if they're asking these deep questions in writing, you need to, you need to what, pause, hang on, do we have a dispute? There must be some misunderstanding. You need to try to be proactive and resolve it now, especially if you're already in one of these pitfalls. You need to cut bait, get out of that situation, make the insured happy, and move on. I don't want anyone to lose their business over something like that. That was, and you can go ahead and read the opinion and all that, but I'm telling you, look for that phrase. The employee wrote it, they quoted it in the opinion. We work on behalf of you. And in that lawsuit, they were going back and forth whether they were AOB holder or this or that, so. Number six, failing to adhere to ethical requirements continued. So this is 5 slash 1590. <clears throat> By the way, IL means Illinois Consolidated Statutes, and I didn't explain this earlier. Apparently in Illinois, just because it's in the statute does not mean it's the most current version because there are laws that are passed and there's a delay from the time the laws are passed before the statutes get updated online. So make sure that you have an attorney check this part of it out, all of these out before you rely on them. Also, I did not do a case law review, so <clears throat> uh, that means that all of these statutes would be interpreted through case law and you need to make sure that all of that still applies. PA shall not represent or act as a company or, indirect or independent adjuster, it's pretty normal, on the same claim. So that's kind of curious, right? So they didn't say you couldn't act as a contractor, so uh, that normally is, is like in there with this and it's not. Enter or accept any contract or POA, okay. This is tricky too, P power of attorney. You cannot enter into a power of attorney that vests the authority with you to choose who shall perform work. So yeah, so let's think about that for a second. If you're the contractor and you're hiring all the subs without input from the insured, does that mean you're acting with authority under a power of attorney? I don't know. I would say probably not, but I'm not an attorney, right? Um, but what's the DOI gonna say if an insured files a complaint? They're gonna find this and they might make the argument that you just chose everybody who did the work on the property. Guys, and I got a lot, lot more really serious stuff in here. We're getting, we're getting there though. <clears throat> Advance money or valuable consideration. See, and that's another tricky thing. These statutes like, advance money, that's pretty normal, right? Don't, don't pay for the insured's expenses. That's what that means. Don't, don't pay for repairs to the property out of your pocket. That's not allowed, except for emergency services. But that or valuable consideration, what the heck does that mean? Well, that can mean a lot of things. In fact, valuable consideration typically means a dollar or $10 or more in a contract to make it valid, so. All right, so we'll go to number seven. Any questions so far? Okay, I hope that means y'all are really into this and I can go really fast. Okay, agreeing to law settlement without authority. <clears throat> A PA may not agree to any law settlement without the insured's knowledge and consent and shall upon request provide a document, provide a document with the scope, amount, and value of the damages. So <clears throat> if you're a public adjuster and you settled the claim and the insured said, hey, where's your, where's your estimate? You didn't pr produce one? That's what that means, you're out, right here. All right, number eight. 
I went ahead, it sounds kind of obvious not to use unlicensed people, right? And it sounds pretty clear cut and dry. But when I thought about it, I was like, well, if you're a contractor, I don't know about you guys, but when I run into business people, a lot of times they're really good at certain things. Usually the task at hand, not so good with the paperwork. Attorneys in the room, business owners, not so good with the paperwork, am I right? Contracts. A public adjuster shall not permit an unlicensed employee or representative of the public adjuster to conduct business for which a license is required. And golly, if you're the contractor and you have staff coordinating repairs, man, and then we go back to those definitions and how broad they are, I think you run into some stuff. So just make sure your processes are really, really good. Presuming the insured will recover attorney fees. I thought this was interesting. I'm not saying this is the only way to recover attorney fees because uh, states generally follow the American rule, which means you don't get attorney fees unless it's authorized by contract or statute or some rule. Um, one of those being if, if you can sanction the other side for some wrongdoing, you can probably get attorney fees for that. But normally, as far as I can tell, this is the statute for attorney fees in any action by or against a company regarding the issue of liability. So first off right there, what I kind of like about this is it's a one-way fee shifting. It's for the insured's benefit, not the other way around. I'm not certain about that, but that's the way I read it. <clears throat> or the amount of loss payable or for unreasonable delay in selling a claim. And it appears to the court, this says and, it appears to the court that such action or delay is vexatious and unreasonable. I'm not sure what that means, but it has to be both. I think that means it has to be really bad. I could be wrong. There could be a case hall that expands a little bit. It is hard. Okay, yeah. The, and here's the other kicker. Why did they do this? Normally, attorney fee statutes say shall award. Not in there. It says may. So you could, you could meet that bar, and then the judge be like, mm, nah. I mean, that, that's a bad time to find out at the end. So you better have good, competent counsel that knows what the judges do in these situations to know if you're going to get attorney fees. Because that's going to play into all of your settlement discussions and, you know, all of that stuff between the attorney and the insured. May allow as part of the taxable cost reasonable attorney fees plus, so number 10, pitfall, presuming the insured will recover for bad faith. So this is the bad faith part. The court may allow as part of the taxable cost reasonable attorney fees plus an amount not to exceed. I thought this was really horrible. Doesn't mean it's extreme, but I'm glad, it's, I'm glad you at least have something. 60% of the recovery, 60,000 or excess amount of the insurance company offered to pay in settlement of the claim. So keep that in mind when you're looking, when you have an eye on bad faith, that looks like a pretty severe cap on it right there. So. In fact, I think that's a $60,000 cap is the way I read that. <clears throat> Any questions? I'm not an attorney, so I can't go into much detail, but that's, that's what the statute says. Um, including out-of-state, so this is probably not as common, but sometimes really savvy business people will try to make it really inconvenient to sue them by, by moving the venue to another state. Well, contracting is one of the riskiest businesses you can ever do in real estate. It's super risky. You not got to know what you're doing. There's so many ways to lose money as a contractor. If you try to, if you try to uh, move the venue, not allowed to do that here. So, guys, I'm running out of time. <laughs> Failing to detail parts and labor, so your your stuff has to have all the parts, labor, total costs, all that lined out. Advertising or promising to pay a deductible, don't do that. Assuming a contingent repair contract will hold, there's a lot of reasons why that, you gotta watch out for that. Failing to provide the consumer rights to brochure, it's in your stuff, make sure you're doing that. Failing to secure workers' compensation, so real quick, because it's super important. In Illinois, you can't really exempt as a contractor, and maybe you guys can tell me I'm wrong, but the way I read this was undertakes work, is liable to pay for, for his own immediate employees and directly or indirectly any contractor, whether principal or sub, to pay for compensation. So workers' comp applies to owners, and you're not allowed to waive out. That's the way I read it. And there it continues with the fines, $500 a day, 10000 minimum. So, And then OSHA, you still have to comply with OSHA. So... I think we covered a lot of that earlier. There's the resources, and there's my information. Thanks, guys.